Uh, first, about the, uh, the water problem. People, you know, you can see these cholera outbreaks uh, here and there around the world and killing thousands of people. And it's an absolutely ridiculous disease. Why? Because it can be killed at 55 degrees. And I'm sure it's very easy to get the sun to provide more heat than was necessary to clean this water. I'll show you later how we do that. Kenya has always had an affinity for solar. Uh, even 30 years ago when solar panels started arriving, Kenya was always the leading country in Africa in implementing this on a micro level. So there are hundreds of thousands of small solar scale systems in Kenya. Now we wanted to go to uh, all the about seven, eight million households in Kenya and make sure they have a solar system. The easiest thing is having a battery and a light separate and the cells with wiring and everything. Put everything in one product. And this one you can just hang in, your, in a belt and you can charge you know, as you walk around in the daytime. And at night you have ample light for reading and doing all kinds of activities after, after dark. So uh, this is sort of like trying to bring the products down to a level where everyone can afford them through using carbon finance and through using microfinance in order to reach everyone. Okay, in the meantime, let's continue with the Kyoto box, which was mentioned. Um, now the Kyoto box, this is something I was doing with my kids, you know, like a little uh, scientific experiment. There's a 240-year-old invention, you know, which was the, uh, it was called the hot box, which is black inside, it's got a glass on top. Basically what you do is you use the greenhouse effect to create uh, heat inside the box. So we made a cardboard cooker, and that's nice enough, but it's gonna be destroyed in the rain. So we came up with this plastic thing, which is really simple. So you just open it up like this, you set up the, the lid to whatever height of the sun. So it has this glass, plexiglass cover that you just remove. You put the casserole inside, then you close the lid like that. Got a little Velcro strap to make sure that dogs and monkeys can't get in. <coughs> we did have a problem though with goats. They like to eat polypropylene, I don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you basically put this in the sun and it cooks food slowly. And that's actually a good thing because you want to cook food slowly. It retains all the vitamins and nutrients in the food. And this is something which saves a lot of CO2 emissions. So it's possible to actually use the carbon credits which are generated from the use of the box to pay for it. And that's why we called our company Kyoto Energy because we, we use that protocol to implement these things on a grassroots level. Now that's a pretty new exercise because um, so far, most carbon projects have been in China and India, and it's been on an industrial basis. It's much easier to retrofit the factory than to do something on the grassroots level. So what we did is to devise a mobile system that can track the carbon on individual households. So even if it's on a per kilo basis, we know exactly what's happening in those households. So the fact that mobile technology has spread so rapidly has been a fantastic boon, actually, for the implementation of this kind of low carbon devices. So you can, it's an oven, so you can bake, you can boil, you cannot fry, however, but we have other products that can do that. And of course, it requires sun. Now, in central province, and here in Nairobi, this green city in the sun is actually the least sunny city in, in the country. So I'm sorry to say, but 80% uh, is arid or semi-arid, so there's plenty of sun to go around everywhere. So the rural areas usually have a lot more than anything else. Now, continuing with the doomsday scenarios, um, the 7 billion tons of CO2 being spewed into the atmosphere, some people say that doesn't matter. The Earth can absorb it. Some people say that may not be a very good idea. Still, 90% of the population have no access to the grid. And, you know, the grid started in Kenya about 100 years ago. So, if you continue with this speed, 10% implementation in 100 years, everyone will have a grid in year 3000. <laughs> Thanks to KPLC again. <laughs> So the idea is uh, to democratize the energy process where people actually generate their own energy. And then uh, here's another blip on the radar. This is if you look at you know, the, the peak oil scenarios where people talk about. And if you don't have you know, any more oil, we can't even grow our food, as we were told earlier. Well, if you look historically from 1000 BC until 3800, which I thought was a good number, um, the fossil fuel consumption graph is pretty steep. And right now we're at the top of that peak. So from here on, it's just downhill. So then you wonder why you want to rely on a resource which is so finite when you have something called the sun which has a four billion year life cycle. Most of us will probably be gone before that. Um, another problem now, 10, 10 billion tons of plastic waste in the oceans. And it's forming large, almost like plastic continents, you know, in, in the Pacific, also now in the Atlantic, even the Indian Ocean, they're discovering these debris. And uh, it's a huge problem, probably even bigger than the 
global warming problem because it has uh, different kinds of poison and it attracts different kinds of poison, toxins, and some of it is, you know, estrogens, which are female hormones, and then if you get that into the population, we end up with every baby is born is a girl. <laughs> so, now, I like women, but... Uh... <laughs> and what, what's been proven, you know, in all these developing countries coming up, you know, India, etc., you provide a decent living conditions for people and they stop having so many children. This is known fact. And many TED speeches have been about this, uh, about this subject. So we have to, just going to have to provide some decent living conditions for the two billion at the bottom of the pyramid. So this is our guy. He's called the Photon the Frog. And he says, we need solutions, we need tools. Because we can only sit together and talk so much. And we're talking now, but without the tools, what can you do? I mean, human, humanity has always progressed on the basis of tools, whether it's the Stone Age, whether it's the... Bronze Age, the Industrial Age, the Nuclear Age, the Information Age. All our ages are always defined by the tools that we use. <coughs> so the plastic waste now, okay, huge problem. The sun with its almost infinite capacity. We use the waste to create plastic solar power. And this Amazingly to me, it's a relatively new concept. I actually don't hear a lot of people talking about it because people are building solar energy systems from, from silicon. They're building them from steel and glass, you know, mirrors. And we're just saying, no, 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 let's not use any of those materials. We can use simple plastic to create a lot of things. And this device is a pretty good example of what can be done. But we have also more sophisticated uh, solutions. The basic, basically, you're solving many problems at the same time. You're trying to solve the plastic waste problem and the energy problem, which also leads to the water problem, all in one. So it's an endless, endless resource meets an endless need. So do we like plastic in this world? Well, this is the production chart, and you see from 1950, it's, it's gone up pretty dramatically, from zero to 260 million tons per year. I know nobody of you can, even, even me, can fathom how much 260 million tons is. But that's per year now. So if you look at the corresponding uh, graph in terms of the recycling, which is there, um, the polyethylene, which are the two most common, uh, or the most common resins of plastic types, you'll find that from 67% recycling to 45, 43, 31, so average is less than 50% is recycled. So that means more than 100 million tons are wasted every year. What do you mean wasted? Well, some is dug into the ground in landfill, some is floating around in the ocean, some is uh, you know, floating around on, on, on the soil and the earth, everywhere. So we have absolutely no control of what's going on with this resource. At the same time, <coughs> we know this charge now. We've seen the, the, this famous square that's, that shows how much solar collectors do we need to build in order to create all the energy required in the world. So we're talking about 15 terawatts. And today, the solar energy generation capacity of the world is, is 15 gigawatts. So that's uh, 1,000 of what we need. So again, if we continue at the same time, then same speed as KPLC doing the, the grid connections. Again, we're talking about year 3,000 before people can actually live off of solar energy. That's way too slow. Now, if you take the 100 million tons of plastic waste, which is a theoretical exercise, but let's say we get hold of all that, we can actually make solar collectors about 5,000 square kilometers per year, which means that problem could be solved in 20 years. And this would be without actually generating any more material, without erecting any factories. Everything is already there, the whole infrastructure. I mean, there are, there's, there are cities in China that you never heard about, which have 15,000 plastics factories. So we're talking about immense resources. And again, funny enough, the poorest nations have the most sun and also the most area. In terms of the available area for solar concentrators, Africa has 80% of that area. So it's blessed with a massive resource. And of course, in North Africa, you have this Desert Tech project, which is a 50 billion euro, oh sorry, 550 billion euro project to create about 20% of the energy for Europe. Uh, from the north and then crossing the, Atlant the Mediterranean with, uh, with power lines. We don't have that proximity to those kinds of markets in Kenya, so we're going to have to use the energy ourselves, which is great because it means activity, employment, and so on. 
<coughs> and as Royla is saying, we have all the sun is scorching our heads. You know, it's, we don't use the solar energy. This is a problem that must be fixed. So we actually have <coughs> very, very good investment climate for solar energy in Kenya. And you know, I like people like to, to criticize government uh, in Kenya as well as everywhere else. But lo and behold, um, there's no duty or VAT for importing solar products into Kenya. It's been like that for a couple of years. About a month ago, there was a new law that passed that every house that's using electricity to heat water is going to have to put solar water heaters on the roof. It's the law. And you have five years to comply. There's what's called a feed-in tariff, which means you're giving a higher price to a renewable energy which is being generated. So wind gets about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Solar gets 20 cents per kilowatt hour. And Kenya was the second country in Africa after South Africa to implement such a scheme when it came out in January. <laughs> so I want to show some more examples of different products which are made from this, you know, plastic philosophy. Um, we show the Kyoto box. Uh, as I said, the, the carbon generated by the use of this is enough to pay for the unit. It's quite interesting. And the, a box like this can save about three quarter of a ton of CO2 per year. The carbon emissions in making the box is 11 kilos. So if you use this thing for five years, you're talking about a huge, huge, huge um, positive balance on the carbon side. With the flashlight I showed you already, you have two different sizes. Very simple way for people to get involved, get rid of the kerosene. We have a campaign in, in one of the slums with a, with a kickboxing club where they're saying kick out kerosene. So we're doing this really on the, on the ground. And of course, the Maasai's, they love our stuff. It's become sort of like the part of the, you know, you have the, the rungu, you have the knife. The mobile. <laughs> and modern Maasai, proper. Green warriors, they call themselves now. <laughs> so the Kyoto box, we love it, and it's, it's been in the media a lot, and you know, it's been uh, talked about. But I actually like the Kyoto bag even better than the Kyoto box, because it's so simple and so, you know, it's a flat little bag that you can fill with 10 liters of water. You carry from the river. Even as you're walking, the water is being cleaned. Two different ways. First of all, because it, the sun goes through the, the transparent side of the, of the bag and uses ultraviolet light to, to kill some, some of the bacteria. And it also raises the temperature with the black behind so that uh, when you reach the pasteurization temperature, which is you know, 65 degrees, you don't have to boil your water, uh, which even if you ask Red Cross, they'll tell you to boil the water. Interesting, since uh, Louis Pasteur, back in 1860s, established the fact that these bacteria die at 55 degrees. So let's implement some of the 150-year-old science. <laughs> the problem is, mamas don't know when the water is pasteurized. They know when it's boiling. You can see that. So what we did is the shower cap, or this cap they put on the bag, which allows you to either pour or shower or close the cap, it changes color when it reaches the right temperature. So that way, you can save 40% of the energy, the time, and the money to clean water. So it's a, it's a multi-purpose kind of product. You hang it upside down, you can shower, you get a 10 minute nice shower from it. So the turbo, when it's raining or when it's dark, what do you do? Well, we have designed a stove that actually runs on, on organic, uh, or at least a waste from farms. So corn cobs and coconut husks are just being thrown today because nobody knows what to do with them. So we say use those instead of cutting down the trees. So together, this is what we call the Kyoto family package. And the carbon uh, is down there, it's about 39 euros. That's about the same the price of the product, or the, or the whole thing. So this is something that we can, just for the cost of distribution, pretty much distribute it to, to people all across Kenya and other countries. So this will lead any family, whether you're a refugee, or you're a villager, you're a slum dweller, you can actually become carbon neutral. Not that you have big carbon emissions from before, because you know, an African has about a you know, 3% of the carbon emissions of an American. But let's, let's go to neutral first and then show the rest of the world how this is done. So Kenyans are extremely frugal when it comes to energy. They use almost nothing. This is a product we made from aluminum, which we'll, we can give a 100-year warranty because it never rusts. You sit on your roof, it just makes hot water. It's a good, good timing to bring the product now that the law came in. So by law, you have to buy my product, which is great. <laughs> And uh, those are products that are available. Now there's more products coming. So we're developing a whole bunch of different ones. So we have this one I spent about five years developing. This is a plastic solar concentrator. It has mirrors that focuses the sun. And it can take about 
one and a half square meter of sun and reduce it into about five squ square centimeters of receiver area. So you can use some really high efficiency solar cells. It tracks the sun during the day. It can be installed, you know, half an hour training, you can install it, toolless assembly. The only thing you need is a coin to tighten the screws at the end. Uh, so compared with other systems like this, we need cranes, bulldozers, and so on. This is a much, much simpler approach. You can start with one, or you can go to a whole field. And right now we're planning the first installation we're doing will be in Naivasha, right on the power grid, which goes to Uganda, just underneath it. So if you compare it with the wind project in Turkana, we have to have 400 kilometers of grid connect to be built. We, we just hook up the wire. <laughs> We also pr produce electricity and heat at the same time with this system. The heat is being used to open a big drying factory so the farmers in, in Navasha can have the product produced dried with the excess heat. We use a gasifier to run a generator so that you can also generate uh, power when it's cloudy again or at night. And this can be made locally. Uh, it's an open source design. We have a system called Cocoon, which is an algae photobioreactor, which means that you can grow nutrients. All the vitamins and minerals you need can be had from the algae omega-3s, antioxidants, some really sophisticated medical things totally organically grown inside these plastic sheets. This is South African design, which I completely love. You've probably seen this before, but instead of carrying 10 or 20 liters of water, you roll 90. So this is, this is the reinvention of the wheel. <laughs> However, it cannot be imported from South Africa because it's full of air, so it's really expensive to bring, so we have to start manufacturing here in Kenya. And that's what we're preparing to do now. You can also take seeds, fertilizer, different things. We also designed a, a low-cost pump that can go really deep, and you can use to just to, to lift the water either manually or you know, using, for instance, the butterfly concentrate to run a small electric engine that can do uh, farm irrigation. So we think uh, food drying and irrigation are probably the two biggest things that needs to be done on the tool side for farmers. We also have some other new lamp designs. Uh, very organic looking things that we're bringing in. This is designed also in Norway. The funny thing on these Norwegians is like the sun. Now, if you look at the humanitarian benefits, you'll see all of the MDG goals. You'll find that each of these products we do, can, you, you can show what it does. For instance, universal primary education, well, if you, if you don't have light at night, you won't be able to do homework. So everything kicks in, in terms of improved maternal health while well, you need clean water. So we're setting up this thing called Kyoto Club, which is a micro fr franchise network where the women in the villages become resellers and they make a little money selling these devices. They get to meet together every Friday and they talk about what to do with energy and water and so on. We're setting up, we signed an agreement with the Narok University to do a Kyoto Institute for Renewable Energy. It's a two year study. And we're building these plastic buildings and setting up, we have a blimp flying over the Mara taking photos from above to be able to document all the biomass. It's a whole separate story. But we do this you know, from Kenya and we spread it to the world. So this is an example where we take Kenya solution, solutions and solve global needs. So we're reselling these products in more than 30 countries. We also developed a mobile uh, tool to be able to, so that households can document the carbon, as I mentioned already. <coughs> we're also doing a carbon aid project. We're saying there's no need to give aid. You can just buy carbon credits. And that's a whole new approach because it gives a lot of the receivers, they're the ones who use this equipment, and then they deserve, they earn the carbon credits. So we're not right now doing a project in Pakistan. Uh, obviously, 20 million people without drink, clean drinking water is a huge problem, and nobody has any, seen the scale which is required to solve this. We need some simple solution. At the end, I just want to say, nothing is new under the sun, which is a quote from the Bible. <laughs> now, Augustine Mouchot, he made a solar printing press back in France in 1888. So it kind of embarrasses us all, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you for your time.